Hey, hey, everybody, how you doing? Today we're going to take a look at price elasticity of demand, but we're going to focus on the determinants of price elasticity of demand, or PED. So just to review, of course, you got to take a look at the equation. How do we arrive at a price elasticity of demand? It's pretty straightforward. A percentage change in the quantity demanded of one product over the percentage change in the price of that same product. And that equation, of course, can be abbreviated this way. Percentage change in the quantity of X over the percentage change in the price of X. So let's take a look at some of the, de the, the determinants of price elasticity of demand. And you may want to stop the video and write these notes down. I'm probably going to go a little bit faster than when you the, the speed at which you could take notes. But the, the thing that's interesting is that you got to understand whether the demand of a good at a particular price is elastic or inelastic depends on several characteristics of the good itself. And so the good itself is going to dictate to the firm um, how elastic or inelastic the behavior of the of the, of the consumers based on the price of that product. So the first determinant, whether or not something will be inelastic or elastic, is the number of substitutes. So the more substitutes a good has, the more elastic the demand will be. So more substitutes equals more elastic, as the consumers can replace a good whose price has gone up with one of its now relatively cheaper substitutes. And that, you know, an easy example would be something like butter. There are many, many, many different kinds of butter. And if the price of one changes, a lot of people would be like, ah, I don't really care what kind of butter I'm going to get. Oh, this, this one's more expensive, so I'll buy these. Right? So the number of substitutes for your particular good, if you were selling them, is going to dictate the response of the quantity demanded based on the change of price. The second thing, and there are five total, the second is, is the good a luxury or a necessity? And if the good is a necessity then changes in the price tend to not affect the quantity demanded. So relatively speaking, the demand for that product would be inelastic. So a necessity, inelastic. Necessity, inelastic. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, if something is uh, something you need in life, um, the more likely it is that you're going to buy it regardless of price. As opposed to something that's a luxury. And if it's a luxury that a consumer could go without, well, then demand becomes relatively elastic. So the more need you have, the more necessity something is to you, the more likely you are to buy it no matter what the change in price. As opposed to a luxury, which would have a different effect. The third thing that would affect the determinants of price elasticity of demand is the time period. And basically, the longer the time period, the more elastic a good becomes. So the amount of time a consumer has to respond to the price change, the more elastic, more time, more elastic it will become. And that kind of makes sense. If prices remain high over a longer period of time, consumers can find substitutes or learn to live without it and do demand, and therefore demand is more elastic over time. So think about something like uh, gasoline. In, in the short run, gasoline is pretty inelastic. You have the car, you have the car you need, and you're going to need to get to work, so you just buy the gas, whatever the price. But over time, let's say you have a big truck, and this is what happened in the, in the United States and all of the uh, U.S. auto manufacturers in the, in the uh, 2008, 2009, is they had made a bunch of trucks, big trucks, pickup trucks that guzzled a bunch of gas, and all of a sudden the price of gas went way up, and the people that had the trucks still bought gas, but people stopped buying the big trucks and bought more compact cars, and over time, of course, the demand for um, gasoline became more elastic. People ended up buying less as a result of having a smaller car. The fourth thing is a portion of income. So the portion of an income the purchase of a good represents. So if a good represents a higher portion of the consumer's income, his or her demand tends to be more elastic. That makes sense. The more, the more expensive something is, uh, the more likely they are to stop using it. And a good example of this might be like uh, foreign holidays. You know, if you're spending three, $4,000 on flights to go some, to some other country, and on all of a sudden the, the price goes up even more, you know, you're going to be more likely to drop that, um, something that, that is taking up more of your income than, say, paperclips or something. And lastly, um, the fifth determinant of demand, and this is something um, that I kind of like to think about, is how addictive is the product? You know, is it cigarettes? Is it beer? Wine? Alcohol? Booze? If a product is addictive or habit-forming, demand tends to be inelastic. And just think about if you know anybody in your life that, that, uh, that smokes and has for years and years and years, you know, the, the, the willingness and ability of that person to buy the cigarettes remains high, super inelastic, even though people keep 
paying more and more and more and more money every every year for la- for cigarettes as a result of the fact that usually they get taxed. Okay, so there you go. The determinants of price elasticity of demand. There are five of them. Use those very effectively in your valuation for price elasticity of demand. All right, talk to you soon.